All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Sorry we're off to a little bit of a late start, but just can't stop that song once I get started. Um, so today we're going to continue talking about objects. We're going to introduce a new concept in how we design uh, our objects, a new idea in um, sort of object-oriented programming, um, this idea that an, a class itself can provide methods and variables that aren't associated with a particular instance of that class. So we'll talk about that. Um, but we're going to start off by looking at a couple of, as promised, a couple of the problems from the midterm. So I just decided to look at the, you know, the two, I think, the two challenging programming problems. And, you know, these, these problems were challenging in different ways. So the last question on the midterm was intended to be difficult, um, to sort of challenge you to combine a couple of different pieces, building blocks together that we've learned so far in the class. This problem, on the other hand, was one of those examples of sort of a problem that basically boils down to um, reading comprehension. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of text that you had to work through to understand how to do this problem, but there actually wasn't very much code to write once we get to the solution. I think that's going to surprise some of you. All right, so, and this is actually, of all the things that we've done in this class, you know, we do a lot of little toy examples and things like that. Um, but this is probably one of the more relevant things that we've actually showed you. By the way, these problems are up on the Prairie Learn homework at this point. Um, one of the things that I just want to point out so you don't think that you're, you're starting to lose your mind or your memory is going bad is that for the first three programming problems on the midterm, there were four different variants of each problem. So the one that we posted isn't necessarily the exact one that you saw in the CBTF. All right, so let's look at, this is, I'm working through the one that we actually posted online. And again, this is actually something that's very, very common. This problem is happily starting to go away because there's more well-structured data in the world, but you're still gonna find yourself working with like an old data set where some, you know, idiot that didn't take this class or didn't know computer science has chosen to uh, store data in some sort of string-based format and has decided to use some sort of custom you know, way of delimiting the fields. So, so again, I've worked with data like this. You know, my, my hope for you in the future is you don't have to work with it as much because we've come up with better ways to save data, some of which we'll talk about later in the class. But you still might see something like this. So here's an example of a record. And the idea here is that um, someone has decided to, you know, store information in a text file as a series of strings where... The string in the first position is the name. This is like a roster for a company. The same name in the second position uh, is their position, and then the third position is a salary, if that person is a paid employee of this silly little company. The delimiter here that this example uses is a colon. So you can see that both in, you know, the example at the top and then in all the examples, uh, sort of the examples we gave you here. So the trick here is taking one of these records, stripping it, you know, somehow breaking it into multiple pieces using the delimiter that was provided, and then returning the data in the format that was requested, okay? So here's the rest of the write-up for this. Um, one of the things we've warned you about is that not every record is gonna have all of the fields. In particular, not every record is gonna have a salary. So you can see over here, the uh, Challen family Roomba is not a paid employee of the Challen family household. Okay. And we also warned you that, you know, this is very common, particularly when you work with data that was generated by humans. There's this whole, you know, series of steps that data scientists now euphemistically refer to as data cleaning, where I have to go through a data set and just make it a little bit cleaner, like take care of human error and inconsistencies and problems and things like that. And a lot of that comes from human input. So imagine that, you know, the person that's maintaining the series of records sometimes forgets to, you know, um, not leave white space between the records, so whatever. This is very, very common. Okay. So again, we gave you an example of that. Um, so you can see that the record for Ziz, the cat, has some white space there at the end between the last delimiter and the salary for the cat. Okay. So again, this was one of the challenges of this problem. There was, there was a fair amount of text to work through. So what do we actually need to do? 
You need to write a function, it's called getSalary. It's gonna give, be given a record in this format. So a single line passes a string, and it needs to return as an int that employee's salary. We provided some documentation for you to use in the exam, the string documentation, um, you know, and when we provided some hints about how to do this. And some of you guys chose to ignore those hints, and that caused problems, because it's much, much harder to do this in certain ways than in others. In particular, we sort of suggested that you use the split and trim functions. And what really got people into trouble with this question was not using split. Okay. Finally, we know, so when you're almost done, this function needs to return an integer. It's given a string. So you're gonna be able to pull the string part out that corresponds to the salary, but how do you actually parse that into an integer? Happily, Java has some nice libraries for doing that. One of them is a function called integer.parseInt. This type of function is gonna make a lot more sense to you today. But this is part of the integer class. It's built into Java, so you don't really need to do anything fancy to use it. Um, you can just call, as we pointed out in our example, you know, integer.parseInt, you pass it a string, and it will return the integer value. I think there's also versions of this that allow you to parse um, strings in other bases. So if you have an octal string or a binary string or a hexadecimal string, you can also parse it. Okay, so let's do this one. Now again, the, the, the biggest challenge here was you know, reading through the documentation and understanding how to use some of the string features. So it's possible that somebody managed to solve this by converting the string into a series of characters and doing something with that array. Did anybody solve it that way? Don't be shy. Okay, maybe it wasn't possible. It's technically possible, but you weren't gonna do it in, in 10 minutes, right? All right, so let's set up our function here. Um, it returns an int, it's called get salary, and because we're using our little playgrounds, we're gonna add static to it. You didn't need to do that in the, in the CBTF. It takes a string as a record. Okay. So what are my steps here? As always, I need to validate my input. Then I'm going to split the string into multiple parts. Check to see if I have a salary and then convert it to an int and return. So that top step, we always do. You were warned that this function could receive return, be passed null, right? Um, this is, you know, something that we're training you to check for, so let's do that. If record is equal to null, you were told to return negative one. That's a, you know, again, this is an example of a function that returns an int where returning negative one is kind of an easy way to signal the caller of this function that you're returning a invalid result. You know, we don't pay people, typically pay people in negative dollars. All right. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna use one of the um, functions that we suggested that you guys try to break this string into multiple pieces something that we've done in lecture. Um, we've had a couple of problems on the homework where the way that we were trying to encourage you to solve them, and I think in several cases we told you to use split, um, to give you some familiarity with that function. So we're gonna do, now let's see here, Java string documentation. If you looked up, if you look up right now the Java string documentation and scroll down to split, it'll give you some sense of, of what it does. Split returns a string array. And it, the, the call to split, I take the string, this is an instance method of the class string, so now you understand why I can do this. We've been talking about objects. So when Java designed the string object, one of the instance methods it provides is split. So I can take a string and I can basically run an algorithm on it that splits it into multiple parts. And you can, the, the argument to split can actually be fairly complex and can do some pretty interesting things. But here I don't need to do very much. Instead, what I need to do is just pass the delimiter that I was given. So now, let's check our work here. Let's see if 
we have an array. Okay. Oh, I have to return something. Can't return zero here. All right. So this looks like it's working. I passed it this record. It split it along the colon, which is the delimiter that this example uses, and now I have an array that has size three. Okay. Now, now I need to do a little bit more validation here. So now I want to check and see if I have a salary. How do I do this? So there were examples where there was no salary at the end. How do I tell? How do I tell if that's the case? Yeah. Yeah, so if the length of the array is three, it means that there's a salary there at the end. If the length of the array is less than three, then there's no salary for me to convert. So this is the last little bit of validation I need to do here. I check the length. If the length isn't three, I'm gonna return negative one. This is also really important, because what I'm about to do is dereference the third element of parts. And if the third element of parts doesn't exist, then you might have been getting a, an array index out of bound exception when you tried to do that. Okay, so I'm, I'm really close now. I've got the parts of my string array broken into pieces. I know that there's a part at the end, corresponds to the salary. Remember, I was, I suggested that you use this function here, integer.parse int. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say integer.parse int parts two. We're really close here. This will work for this example. Let's try it. Yeah, good. What am I missing, though? This small problem with this. So what happens if I do this? Yeah, I've got a problem here. Runtime error, no. You would have gotten a more descriptive error message if you tried this in the CBTF. What's the problem? Yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately, and again, I, I can't, I can't defend Java here, but for whatever reason, integer.parse int won't remove white space from the string for you. So if there's white space, it just fails. It gives up. And so here's the place where we use the second function that was suggested that you use. So this is it. I mean, I can, you know, take the comments out now that we're done. So this is seven lines of code. Again, an example of a problem, and this won't be the last one that, like this that you'll see in this class. We, we will, like I said, work better on timing in the future to make sure you have more time to do the problem. But, you know, a lot of figuring out how to approach this problem was reading the documentation. It's not a lot of code here to write. One of the more common mistakes, and again, I, I'll refer to it as a mistake, it is probably possible to solve the problem this way, but there were a lot of wrong solutions that were trying to turn the string into a character array and then do something with it. That'll work. I mean, if you had an hour, you could probably get it to work. But essentially what you're doing is you're re-implementing split. Like, instead of saying, I'm gonna let the string, the built-in string function do the heavy lifting for me, you're actually re-implementing the split function. And that's gonna be hard to do in the time that's allowed. Questions about this problem before we go on and talk about GCD? So I'm, I'm gonna remind you of this. We have a quiz coming up this week. Let me explain my algorithm for writing quiz questions. I go to the homework questions from the week before, and I make small modifications to them. That's it. So if you know how to do the homework problems, you should be well prepared for the quiz, and that's the best way to study for the quiz. Our goal is not to ambush you with anything new on the quiz, so that's why I go back and I start from the homework problems. Also because I'm sort of lazy, and those, I know that those problems work. You guys have tried them, and so I know if I make some small changes to them, it's likely that those changes will work as well. I'm actually not that lazy, but um, that's how I do, th that's how I do these. 
So this problem, for example, came out of those phone number problems that we did in class and then on the homework. That was the inspiration for this problem. It's a string parsing problem. Now, some of you got away, I, so I, I kind of know what happened here, which is that some of you got away with doing those string problems, the phone number problems, by just using the fact that, you know, the, the, the string had, like, a particular structure to it that you could infer based on the index. So with the phone numbers, like, there's three digits and then a skip and then three more digits and a skip. Here you couldn't do that, right? You had to use, you had to use trim, uh, split. Okay. Let's do GCD. I don't know if we're gonna do anything else today other than do these problems, but that's fine. All right, so this question was intended to be hard, um, but it was intended to, um, you know, the description of this question, the idea here was to try to get you to implement an algorithm. We didn't ask you to come up with an algorithm, that's a tough thing to do in a timed setting. Instead, what we did is we gave you an algorithm, and again, this was another problem that had quite a bit of text to work through. We kind of told you, here's how we would approach this. That wasn't a requirement. There were actually a couple students that solved this using Euclid's algorithm somehow. Those people should really be teaching the class, um, because the algorithm that we provided is, is a lot simpler. But here's how this works. So GCD of, of, you know, a set of integers, more than one, the largest positive integer that divides all of them. There were a couple of cases you had to look out for um, where your function was supposed to return negative one. That's if the array was null, empty, or all zeros, right? So the GCD of an array of all zeros isn't well defined. So again, you weren't expected to know Euclid's algorithm or have memorized it in order to solve this problem. Instead, we gave you a simple iterative solution that will work. Is this the most sophisticated way to do this? No. Is this how GCD is implemented by a math library? No. But again, this is one of those places where as a, as a beginning programmer, you know, you don't need to get fancy. The computer is far fast enough to do this for you, even using a fairly simplistic, sometimes we call this a brute force approach. Okay. So here's what we suggested you do. First, you find the maximum value. That's your starting point. That's the, you know, the, the largest number that could potentially be the GCD is the maximum value. This also allows you to determine whether or not you were given all zeros. Now you start at that value and you work downward. So this problem has a similarity with the least common multiple problem that you guys worked on for MP1, MP0, in the sense that there you started at a value and worked up until you got to something that could, the largest possible value that could be the LCM. Here we're starting at a value and working downward. So I'm gonna pick a number and I'm gonna say, is this number the GCD or not? If it is, it should divide all the values. So I know how to test whether it is or not. If it's not, I move on. I go on to a smaller value, a smaller value, a smaller value. Eventually I'm gonna get to a value that I know works. What is that value? One, right? So if a set of numbers is relatively prime, their GCD is one. But I'm starting at the max, I'm working downwards, I know eventually I'll get to one. So eventually this algorithm is going to terminate. Okay, so let's go through this one as well. This returns an int, it was given an array of integers, we'll call this values. So let me write down the steps here again. I'm gonna validate inputs, find maximum, check for all zeros, and then I'll just put work downward here, and then we'll scaffold this in a minute once we get there. So there's a couple of steps here. But this is an example of, of a, a slightly more sophisticated algorithm where we're actually expecting you to be able to combine some different pieces together. There's not just one loop here or one set of nested loops, there's a couple of steps. All right, so what are the things that could be wrong with values if it's null or if its length is equal to zero, I'm gonna return negative one. 
So I want to point out, this, this may seem simple, but this line of code on line three, when I started to look at some of the solutions, is not something that I saw everybody do. When I did see people do this, you know, there's a level of sophistication that you're bringing to the problem that I really appreciate, right? Why is that? So why is it safe on the right side of that if statement to check values.length? What if values is null? Isn't that gonna cause a problem? Yeah, up in the balcony. Bingo. So when you write this, you're showing me you understand how or statements work. If values is null, the right side of this or statement will never be executed. Because I'm just gonna return one immediately, sorry, negative one immediately, and I'm done. You could write this as two if statements, it works fine. But by writing it this way, again, you're demonstrating an understanding of how these conditional statements are evaluated. In that I do short circuit evaluation. As soon as Java can evaluate the if statement, it stops. So it says if values is null, return negative one. I only get to the right side of the or statement if values is not null, and then I check the length, right? Okay, nice. So we're done with this. Now we need to find the maximum. So it turns out, for this particular example, you could do this. So I'm gonna set my max to zero. I'm gonna go through all of the values in the array. I'm gonna say if values i is greater than max, set values i. I'll just print off this, and then I'll return zero here so that we can run this. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something a little bit, so we didn't, we have not talked about this. Oh, stop it. Oh, and it needs to be static. So I'm, I'm cheating a little bit here. Let me just point out this. This is just a, a little bit of a clever thing about Java. So Java can allow you to provide different numbers of arguments to a function. So this is something called a variadic uh, set of arguments. So what that invocation says is that this function can take any number of integer arguments. Right? I can give it one, I can give it ten. So that's kind of cool. What you get when you do this is you get an array. So essentially, you can see that I'm treating values like an array. The declaration of GCD is a little bit different, um, but the way it works is, is identical once I'm inside the function. So it's a chance to introduce this. It just makes my call to GCD a little bit simpler because I don't have to declare an array. Okay. So this seems like it's working to find the maximum. Why? Normally this code does not work to find a maximum. Why does it work in this case? If I give you a general array of integers, this code will not find the maximum over that array. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, so what, so the reason this works is because all the integers are positive, and this is part of the problem description. If all the integers in my array were negative, what's this gonna return? Zero, it's gonna think the max is zero. So again, you could write it this way, but if you're trying to impress me, or if you're trying to impress an employer, you write it like that. Why does this work? When I get to line five, I know that values has at least one element. I already checked to see if it was empty. So I set the maximum to the first value in the array. And then I test every other value. So this ensures that the maximum is one of the elements from the array, which it has to be. Maximum over any array is an element inside the array. This also will work if all the values are negative. Okay? So let's make sure this still works. It does. Okay, so I'm done with this step. There was one more pathological case that we gave you, which was if all of the values were zero. At this point, I can determine if I got an array with all zeros. How do I do that? Yeah. Yeah. If I give you an array with all zeros, 
the max will be zero. So I, now I can check here if max is zero, return negative one. Okay. So now I'm ready to do the actual work in my function. I know where I'm starting. I know where I'm going. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna call this divisor, and I'm gonna set it to max. I'm gonna set it, I'm gonna continue why it's greater than one, and I'll point out why that is in a minute. So I'm checking values one at a time now. So I know the largest possible value that could be the GCD, and I'm working down. For each value, how do I check if it's the GCD? It's the GCD if it divides all of them equally. There's a couple different ways you can do this. I like doing it this way. I'm gonna say found GCD is true, and then I'm gonna go through all the values in values, and I'll do this for fun using an enhanced for loop. I'm gonna say if value divided by the divisor is not equal to zero. So here I'm gonna do two things. First, I'm done checking this value. If it doesn't divide any of the values in the array, it can't be the GCD, so I don't need to keep going, so I'll break. But before I do that, I also wanna mark that I didn't find the GCD. So this is an example, again, of one of these building blocks that we've been using in this class. This is a small little state machine. Found GCD starts off as true, and as soon as I find a value that doesn't work, I stop. So this is, again, one of these, you know, this is a, a, a very simple little search. I'm searching for a value in the array where it divided by the potential divisor is not zero. I'm gonna say found GCD is equal to false. Now down here, I have a flag I can check. So if found GCD is still true after I've gone through all the values in the array, then none of those values produced a non-zero divisor, remainder when divided by divisor, and I'm good, I'm done. Just return straight out of here. So I set up my for loop specifically here to allow me to handle one case. So it's possible that all the values I pass are relatively prime. If they're relatively prime, what should the GCD be? One. So I've, I'm checking all the values going down to two, but then my loop's gonna break when, it, when divisor becomes one. So when divisor becomes one, I'm gonna go back to the top of my loop on line 14, I'm gonna check, is one greater than one? No, I'm done. I break out. So what should my return statement on line 26 be? Exactly, so at this point, I've tried every other value, none of the larger values work, and I fall back to the answer that I know. Now again, you can write, so let me, I can, you know, you can write this like this. Oops, nope, let's try that, yeah. So you can have the loop go all the way down through one, and then it'll just always return on line 23. But why is this slightly more elegant, slightly more beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, so it's slightly more efficient, that's true. So once I get to one, I don't have to check the list. And this would be particularly bad if it was a long list, but there's one other thing here. I have to have a return statement on line 26. If I don't have that, the compiler will complain because the compiler is not smart enough to understand what I'm doing. The compiler doesn't understand that I will always return if this loop finishes. And so, if I'm gonna have to have that return statement, it might as well do something for me. So in this case, that return statement will actually be used. Okay, let's see if this works. Looks, yeah, looks right. Let's try a different set of values. Try some values that are relatively prime. Good. Again, this, this question is probably more than we should have asked you to do in the CBTF at this point in the semester, but you, know, you could certainly expect to see this on the third midterm with, with a little bit more time. 
These are, this is kind of what we're gonna be doing throughout the rest of the semester. When we talk about more sophisticated algorithms, we start working with trees and lists and arrays and doing sorting and searching and other things. It's building up a more sophisticated algorithm based on pieces that you already know. So these little homework problems we've been asking you to do are kind of these, like, building blocks that you're then gonna plug in to other programs. Oh, I need to find a max, I know how to do that. Oh, I need to search for a value, I know how to do that. Oh, I need to test whether the array matches a condition, I know how to do that. Kind of what goes, so what changes, you know, what goes inside this statement might be a little bit different. You know, I might be looking for a max or a min, but these, these components come back over and over again. All right, questions about this? What's that? Yeah, so great question, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I, it's probably my bad for trying to introduce a new idea in the middle of trying to do a review problem. Um, so when you declare cd int dot dot dot, so when you do that, Java allows the function to take as many integer arguments as you want, and then converts them into an array for you. So when the function starts to run, all of those arguments are in values. So you'll see I can run it with, you know, as many arguments as I want, it still works. Hard to see that it actually ran here, but let's give it, let's give it some other arguments. Yeah. Good question. Other questions about this before we go on? Yeah. So, ah, good question. What if the array contains negative numbers? As an int of an array of past positive integer values. So the problem specification promised you that we would not put negative numbers in. And we didn't. If, if it says that and we, and we don't, I'm a bad man. Yeah, no. Yeah, we, we, we didn't pass you negative values. Yeah. You would have been, like, we could have asked you to do the problem in a way to check for that, right? Uh, but there was no need. Okay, good. So let me just remind you that again, how do I, how did I write quiz four, which you guys will start tomorrow? That's the introduction to objects quiz. Where did the programming questions on that quiz come from? They came from the homework problems you were working on last week. And I'm saying that partly because there were some of you that I'm sure were busy studying from the midterm or whatever that didn't do those homework problems. So please go back if you haven't and make sure that you know how to do those homework problems because they will be on the quiz in slightly modified form. All right. So for the next couple of lectures, we're going to, this is sort of keyword bingo in Java. These modifiers that you've seen in your Java source code, static, final. We're gonna talk about what they mean. So static in Java allows us to declare both methods and variables. So it's very much like the objects we were talking about before the combined state and behavior, data and algorithms. But what static does is static associates that variable or that function with the class, not with an instance of the class. And I know that this is confusing, but it's gonna make more sense in a minute. That's actually a great way to understand the difference between the blueprint and the actual objects that, that we're creating from it. So in this case, what I'm doing, code from line one through six, is by marking no, that variable is static, there is only one copy of it associated with the class. If the variable wasn't marked as static, then every time I created a new instance of course, I would have a new count. But by marking it static, I only have one count. And the count is always there. You don't have to create an instance of the object to access it. Same thing with print name. So you've been seeing on the MPs that we've given you to work on, we've been asking you to write these static methods. Some of you may have seen that they're all marked as static. The reason is that they don't, until now, we haven't actually been asking you to do anything with object state. We haven't asked you to create objects or work with the internal state of objects. And so in Java, to some degree, the way you write a library function 
is you mark it as static. So for example, um, system.out.println is a static function. Integer.parseInt is a static function. You see the name of the class, which is integer, that parse int. Did we create a new instance of the integer class to use that method? No. We were able to use it immediately. So now, I don't want you guys to, so, so one thing that's important is that static methods and static variables can be accessed either directly by using the name of the class or from any instance of that class. So for example, on line nine, I have a static function called print name. This is a silly function on my course. You'll see I have not created a course object. There's no instances of course on line nine. And yet I can still call that function. The syntax is a little bit different. I use the name of the class and then the name of the function. I'm still using dot notation, but I'm not using the dot notation on an instance of the class. I'm using it on the class itself. Now on line 11, what do I do? I create a new course object called CS125. So now I have an instance of course. Now there's one course in the system, one instance of course that has been created, but I can still call that function. So the static methods are accessible either directly from the class, but they're also accessible from every instance of the class. Okay. So one of the things that's really nice about our chance to talk about static at this point is it allows us to really sort of tease out what's happening when you use objects. So static methods cannot use this and they can't access instance variables or instance methods. Why is that? Because I don't need an instance of the class to call them. So it's possible that I call a static method, a class method, when there's no instances of the class that have ever been created. It's also possible to call a static method without specifying the instance that is running that method. So remember when I, and, and this is something we're gonna give you more practice on, when I create instance variables, every created instance of that class has its own copy of those variables. And so when I use this, or if I refer to them directly, I'm referring to my copy of that variable, which is different than all the other instances of that object that have been created. With static, there's no instance of the object that I have a reference to. I don't know which one I'm being called on, so I can't use the this keyword. All right, we'll get some practice on this in a minute. So static variables, like I said before, are shared by all instances of the class. So let's look at this example. I have a static variable called count. As soon as the program runs, there's a copy of count set to zero. So I could print off the count even before I create any instances of the course. So on line nine and 10, I create two different instances of course objects. And then on line 11, here's an example of using the dot notation on a public static variable to modify. So I'm incrementing the, the uh, static class variable count on line 11. Both 12 and 13 will print one because they both share that variable. If I increment it again, they both print two. All right, so let's play around with this a little bit. So here's an example. I have a class called course. And, you know, when you start reading class definitions, it's really important to zero in on this static keyword because it makes a huge difference in terms of how that variable behaves. So here I have an instance variable called name. Every course has its own copy of name. Every course can have a different name. Until I create an instance of course, there is no name. If I create 10 instances of the course object, there are 10 names, and they can all be different. On line three, I have a static class variable. So when the code is run, 
there's one copy of this, and no matter how many instances, of course, I create, whether it's zero or 10,000, there's still only one copy of count shared by everybody. All right, and so what am I gonna, what's gonna happen here? So let's, let's think about this. So I have, I create two new courses. I have a course constructor on line seven that allows me to set the name. And then I bump the count on line 15, I print off the count. So what do I think this is gonna print? Let's try this, okay. So now I'm calling an instance method on my course called print count that has access to that course's name. And if I use this dat count, what I'm actually referring to here is the class variable count. And as we've done before, if we want to, we can remove this, and this will work fine. Who runs this? Okay, good question. So the question is, if I, so you're saying, you're saying nothing? Does this work? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Yeah. So remember, once I provide a constructor for the class, I have to provide any other constructors that I might want, right? So in this case, I have a constructor that takes a single string and sets the name. I don't have a constructor that doesn't take, I'd have to write it. So I could do, I could do that if you want, but, but let's, let's not. All right. So now, let's have some fun, because one of the things I might do with count is use it to keep track of how many instances of that object there are. This might be useful on an MP that you're working on, maybe. All right. So now what am I doing? In my constructor, Remember, the constructor's just code. In my constructor, I'm incrementing count. So every time I create a new instance of that class, count gets incremented. All right? And then the other thing is, let's mark this as private, because I don't want ever anybody messing with it. Private and public work very much the same way on class methods or static methods as they work on instance methods. So by marking this as private, that line on this line's gonna fail. So let's get rid of it. Actually, I'll let you see what happens. Right, private member cannot be accessed. So I've gotta get rid of this one in order for this to work. Okay. So now print count on line 16 and 17 both print two. Why is that? Because both constructors have run before I print the count. Imagine that I move 225 down here. Now what's gonna happen? So the first time print, so let's walk through it line by line. Line 14 runs, I call the constructor defined on course. That constructor sets the name of the course. It also increments the private static class variable, which started at zero, and when I'm done is one. Then I print the count, so what's the current count of all the course objects that have been created? It's one. So it's gonna be 125 plus, you know, with a one separated by a space. At the bottom now I have 225 with the two. I've created two instances. Questions about this before we go on? This is a, you know, static is something that's gonna take a little while to wrap your mind around, and it's something that, why one of the reasons we ask you to do uh, work with it on MP3. Okay, so like I said, public and private also work on static variables and methods. So a public static variable can be read or written by anyone. A private static variable can only be read or written by methods defined on that class. Those methods can either be instance methods or class methods, static methods. They can also be constructors. Yeah. Yeah, so a great question. The question is, can I overload a static method? Yeah. Yeah, they're just methods like anything else. 
so I can overload static methods. That's very common, actually. Um, all right, public and private um, methods. A public static method can be called by anyone. A private static method can be called only by other methods on that class, either static methods or instance methods. Okay. I don't know if I'm gonna do this example today. I think I'll come back and do it next time. All right, so we're not gonna get to final yet. Well, hold on, I'll, I'll finish up, because this is our last thing on static. So remember, and this is something that we're gonna address, I think, soon, but remember, one of the problems we had with Java constructors was that there's no way for them to fail they always have to return an instance of the object. So if you give me like a bunch of bogus, let's say I have a class that is supposed to, you're supposed to initialize by passing a positive integer or a non-null string, and you give me a negative integer or a null string, what am I supposed to do? Talk about this in a few days, there is an option here, which is to generate an error that the caller then has to handle, but without doing that, there's no way for me to return a value that indicates that something went wrong. I still have to, the constructor always returns an instance of the class. So instead, what we can do, if we want, is, I don't think I'm gonna have time to do this example, but maybe we'll start with this on Wednesday. We can create, we can force people that use the class to create new instances by calling a static method. So you might provide, in this case, I might provide a method called public static storage create int size, okay? So what is this? This is a public method. It's static, so it's defined on the class, on an instance of the class. What does it return? It returns a new instance of the storage class, and it's called create. It takes an int called size. So now what I can do is I can say if size is less than zero, return null. And actually I should be less than or equal to zero because what's the point of my storage class? It doesn't store anything, okay? We'll pick up here on Wednesday, but the trick to making this work is to actually create a private constructor so that nobody can create instances of this without calling your create method. Okay, just a few announcements. So MP3 is out. It's due two weeks from today. Let me point out something. It's Monday. There's no MP due today, but there's still a gazillion staff members holding office hours today from 10 to 5. So it is a fantastic day to come in for help. All right? I'm gonna have office hours this morning from 10 to 12 if you still wanna talk about your midterm. Um, get started on MP3. I will see you all on Wednesday.